Here's your student, Mary, who wants to know if you know stuff there, she's going to be socialized. Oh yeah. oh yeah. What's that? Did you run your seatmate off? I guess. <laughs> it's a family <laughs> practice box. They don't want to deal with us. <laughs> and we would if they would have held up at the room. I know the whole fellows list are kind of just some of them. Well, maybe not them. <laughs> the guys I share call with are cool. <laughs> That's the interesting thing about so many special issues. One on one. One on one. It's far from yeah. ACM. You know, yeah. Oh yeah. They're old. They take a long time. They got a lot of yeah. interaction. Though. Yeah, but. Uh, <laughs> Through. Something will hit, you know, and it's just like, been restored. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put him there. <laughs> Some of the people that are on there, like, constantly. must have checked in security. Yeah, any work done. So well, maybe they don't. Uh, I don't know. You see, with a name like that. Or they have one of those jobs where they're always in front of their computer. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, I, I don't see it every time, you know, but I'm. Yeah. Well, I lurk a lot, you know. I am uh, not. So you don't every post up, up. Very little, very little. I pull them up, and uh, of course you only pull up about every third or fourth, and you read down the whole chain. And, okay, delete, delete, delete. Yeah. No, I don't. Got too many things. There really is. There really is. And so. Uh, no, I don't post And it's it not meant to be productive, like to lead to action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's never any follow-up step ever taken to action. Right. Okay, yeah, right. Occasionally things come across that it's like, this needs to get done right away. Okay, I, I can We should do this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nancy. Of course, I'm also a little gun shy, you know, of saying, yes, I should do that, because somebody's going to turn around and say, and tell me to do it. Right. Young kids are really difficult to juggle. Yeah, 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is the opportunity. Yeah. An access and accessibility to the file. That's what you're they do have been and we actually yesterday we had actually had some folks covering it more than the just like the, 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 the town hall, but just 
Don't line up and yeah. Yeah. Just, No, no, it's, it's fine. Yeah. 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 So they're still paying. I mean, Oh, these? these? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't do. We, Nancy Ann did another one earlier today. Okay. But um, we don't do these. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. it's kind yeah. of a. Somebody's going to write the Well, it's a production to make sure yeah. everyone can come in, but oh, then yeah. it's also webcast. Right. So it's, yeah. I, yeah. I, I knew there was a big initiative this week to be talking to lots of folks. Yeah, yeah yesterday they did the town hall. Yes. That right. was the president did that. that. So, they, I mean, they try not to have too many like, competing things. So, yesterday was the town hall. Today, Nancy Ann's doing a bunch of this. Tomorrow's a holiday. But, um, and then once next week, when Congress starts back up again, it'll be the same kind of pitter patter. So, yeah. I love it too, because yeah. I go to Philadelphia. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. 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 It's and just from It's such a different way of doing things, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We were just remarkable. It's yeah. very different. It's different even different for us. <laughs> Oh, okay. 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 No problem. Have fun. 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 Thank you for coming in. Getting toward a holiday weekend, I appreciate it. I'm Nancy Ann DeParle, and I've met some of you before. And for those of you I haven't met, look forward to a good discussion. We're today going to be talking about the critical role that uh, primary care providers play in our health care system. And it's something that the president talks about. Well, if, you've, if you haven't been listening recently, <laughs> um, he's talking about healthcare every day, and he always talks about the importance of primary care and how he wants to make sure that uh, we aren't just um, covering people and offering people affordable health care in the old system. He wants to make sure that it's in a new system that has a renewed emphasis on lowering costs and on uh, getting people the right care at the right time, and that means primary care and prevention. So you all play a critical role in helping us to figure that out, and we appreciate it. Um, I'd like to say hello also to everybody watching this discussion 
um, www.whitehouse.gov and www.healthreform.gov. So this is a new, one of the innovations here at the White House, and you all are going to have to help me um, do this. So in addition to streaming uh, this meeting on the Internet, as we always do, there's a live chat going on about the meeting on Facebook right now. And people are also submitting their questions and comments through the White House website. So there's a lot going on. Jen Canestra from our office is being kept up to date on everybody's reactions. And during our discussion, we're going to ask her to let us know what everyone's thinking. Jen's right over there with the laptop. We know that health reform has to improve primary care in this country. Uh, we know that we need to increase the number of primary care clinicians. And we want your suggestions on that, including how to keep more primary care clinicians uh, satisfied with their work and continuing to do it because that's part of the solution too. Uh, we know there are a lot of people retiring. Uh, we know that we can cut costs and help Americans to live longer, happier, and healthier lives if we invest in prevention and wellness programs that keep Americans out of the doctor's office in the first place. And that's why President Obama is committed to reform that emphasizes patient involvement and promotes prevention, wellness, and primary care. To put it another way, without reform that improves primary care and strengthens primary care and what you do every day, uh, we won't be able to meet our goal of giving every American high quality and affordable health care coverage. So today we're really eager to hear your ideas. And I want to introduce my colleague, Dr. Pavita Patel, who is uh, working here at the White House with us and uh, helped to organize this meeting. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up and uh, I guess, am I first supposed to to do a video, is that um, right? We do, we do in fact have a um, YouTube question that was submitted yesterday for the President's online town hall. Um, and so we can certainly start with that and then um, you know, open up for okay, people to make great. comments. Okay, great. It's gonna be back here. health insurance with a high deductible. I find myself motivated not to go in for care until things get really bad. How could the health reforms you and Congress are working on change the system so it would encourage prevention and treating health care problems before they worsen and get more costly? Well, there's an example of a policy that doesn't make sense, a high deductible for preventive care. So a young man who I assume is healthy and hope he is, but should not be discouraged. I bet everyone here would agree from coming in and getting uh, preventive care. So that's a good way to start off the discussion. I guess I'll just open it up by asking you, um, you how we can change the system so we encourage prevention and treating health care problems before they get worse uh, and lead to something a lot more expensive. Keith, you want to start? Sure. Um, I'm an independent community pharmacist. And um, pharmacists, from a pharmacy perspective, pharmacists for years have only been pay paid for a final drug product. That's it. We're the purveyor of a commodity. Outcomes is what we need to show, and pharmacists see more, more, more and more, um, more patients, more individuals on a daily basis than any other health care provider. We're well positioned to show outcomes. It's been proven, it, and it has been shown. Medication therapy management. Um, which is under Medicare Part D. Face-to-face -face contact with a community pharmacist saved twice of what just a phone conversation would be. Twice, twice what a phone conversation would be. Insulin injection technique, compliance. Compliance is a huge issue. One-third of all hospital visits could be avoided or could be prevented if patients were compliant and adhered to medication therapy. Very simple. Um, and how, small price how widespread to pay. is, you know, medication therapy management? It's a fancy word, but really, you're just talking about your pharmacist consulting with you and understanding what you're taking and making sure that you're doing it properly. Right? Doing it properly, working with the patient to make sure they're taking it properly, changing them possibly to a, a cheaper alternative, working with the physician mm -hmm. um, on the best therapy possible for that patient and when they can afford. How many different kinds of drugs are there out there these days? <laughs> <laughs> I can't count that high. Um, I know in my pharmacy, I roughly have uh, probably around 1,400 on the shelf, 14 so, different SKUs just on the shelf. That's a lot um, for yeah, in the top a patient two. to understand that, you know, if they're taking four or five things, they may not understand what sure. they should be doing. 
Um, I know, but 200 of those is roughly about 54% of what I fill, but yet I carry, you know, that inventory on a day-to-day -day basis. And how many insurance plans right now cover medication therapy management? Um, right now, it's Medicare Part D mandates, um, but there are very, very few individual plans um, that actually cover medication therapy management, and that's where we're losing our patients. Um, you know, private, and private employers don't benefit from this. Um, individuals like this young gentleman don't benefit from that. And, you know, my employees don't benefit that, from that being a small business person. Um, and small business employees more people across this country than the large businesses. But yet we're losing all of those folks, and those are the ones that can't afford health care right now. Mm -hmm. And they're being lost because they can't afford the premiums. They can't afford to go to the doctor when, when they don't have the insurance. So you see both sides of it if see you're a small business owner. Interesting. Yes, ma'am. Who else wants to get in here? Fred? We really need to change our You're system. You're the American College of Physicians. Right. Thank I you. practice general internal medicine in a small town in Tennessee. I was going to say, do I know you? I yes. think I do. Okay. Um, and Bob, and I know you too. So this well, okay. but we actually uh, were celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. It's primary care practice, eight physicians, Where are and you? a nurse practitioner. Uh, and never in our history have we been more challenged than we are in the current environment. And, and I would just throw out, and this is an element that I think everyone, including your questioner, shares, we need to align the incentives for a system that truly works. We need to have providers who are able to provide cost-effective, evidence-based care, and we need to have people have uh, an easy way to get into that system. And in that case, I might use the term system without quotes, because we clearly don't have a system right now. Uh, it, it seems almost like any time I see a patient, there may be an unnecessary burden or, or way in providing them care. I may not know what medication is covered under their formulary, uh, even though it's, a, it's appropriate. I may not know whether a screening test for colon cancer is covered under their insurance, even though I get dinged if we don't do it. The same website that dings me won't provide me an answer to the question of, uh, whether it's covered or not. So anything that allows us, when we see individuals, to provide the best quality care in the most efficient uh, way possible is, uh, is something that we need to, to move toward. And there are a lot of different elements to, to that. So but, you waste a lot of time then trying to figure out if preventive care is even covered. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and individuals like this have been shown by, by studies, if deductibles are high, they don't seek care. Right. And, you know, high deductibles are wonderful for something that isn't based on the evidence. I would, would, right. Uh, right. would, would endorse that heartily. But yeah. if someone's not taking medication that's going to keep them out of the hospital, uh, then that clearly is penny wise and pound foolish. Fred, does your practice have an electronic health record? We, or how? For, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Five you years ago. practice this. So. <laughs> <laughs> Five years ago, we invested our money in an electronic health record wow. system. Mm. And, you know, I think the general estimates are that physicians gain about 15 percent of the economic benefit of those systems. And we did it because we knew it was the right thing to do. And we know that it, I mean, I was managing Coumadin from my, from the ACP office this morning, which, by the way, also is a service not covered under Medicare. I'd love to have that discussion <laughs> <laughs> later. Telling people whose blood was too thin, and what dose, critical. and to call yeah. me on the 4th of July to um, have a follow-up study and to let me uh, adjust the dose. But that is something that we know has, has been helpful. We're able to uh, to track things, although it's you know sometimes hard to uh, uh, you know to learn all of the techniques, and we would love some help from the administration on that. But we endorse what the administration has been doing to try to simplify things and try to enhance technology. But we also need sort of a go-to person to help have a two-way conversation with people who are in practice. I could give you suggestions that could probably cut that uh, health affairs estimate of $65,000 worth of administrative uh, cost. I could probably cut that in half. If, if you would help us or, or, or you would, uh, would foster a common website 
where I could take your insurance card, get that information, it would automatically tell me which, a, which angio, uh, uh, which ARB was, was covered if, uh, if a certain generic medication was, was contraindicated, and have that only take 15 seconds in an office visit as opposed to 30 minutes, 29 minutes of which is going through the 1-800-MOMMY-MAY-I, and only one minute <laughs> is, is clinical information. But there, there are plenty of, of opportunities That's for us to idea. enhance care. It's a great yeah, idea. Thank you. Mona? Um, I'd like to speak to Fred. I'm a nurse practitioner. I practice in rural Appalachia. You heard actually. the president talking about nurse practitioners the other night, I hope. Yes, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are an independent nurse practitioner practice, and we're out in the Appalachian Hills, and there are no other providers. And who we work the most with is our community pharmacist, which we've been discussing. Um, but I, we've been all electronic medical records for 10 years. The problem that we find is the cost of the support and the upkeep of the good programs is overwhelming to us. That's number one issue. And addressing what you asked earlier about um, how you get the primary care providers into prevention, we've got a mobile unit that we've just put on the road about four months ago, and we've gone out to the churches and the schools and do free screenings while we had grant funds. We don't, we're going to run out of grant funds, but doing free screenings so we got really early identification, then went after the grandmothers because we're in a matriarchal kind of society mm -hmm. and started educating them on how can we keep the grandchild healthier as they grow. And we're trying to track some of the lifestyle changes because of it. But you really got to go after them at the beginning and get early identification. And that it's not payable. <laughs> so I can't bill for it. So without grant funds, it's not <clears throat> something you can sustain. Diana? Um, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I also work in a, a family practice. But I'd like to go back to the original question of I'm young, I ha I'm healthy, I have a high deductible, I, I can't afford to pay for preventive care. Um, in Indiana, the, the governor um, and the legislature developed a program for people who don't have health insurance. It's a kind of a public-private um, coverage program. Um, and in that program, all of the um, recipients of that insurance plan are required to get um, health, their, their preventive health care every year, and, f and they are given something called a power account, which is $1,000 that they can use to pay for preventive things that don't get covered otherwise. And, you know, I don't know why that couldn't be something that, if we're looking at an employer plan, an employer contribute to that power plan. In fact, the hospital that owns my practice is recruiting people for this program because it also saves the hospital money and they are funding the power account and these people are called in fact i just talked to one of my patients yesterday I said looks like you're ready for your annual exam when was your last pap mammogram etc and she said oh i don't know and i said well you have the healthy indiana plan and they're going to call you in about two months to tell you you better get in here to have that done or they'll take the power account away so you know you could have some kind of a, a deductible for certain types of things, but then you have this medical savings account or, or power account that you can use for those healthy things. It might also help, you know, for insurers to maybe go in a partnership with patients on a combination of a medical savings plan and a, a contribution for uh, those kinds of preventive care <coughs> things. That's great. So we have a idea. question. We have a question, yeah. From from the internet. <laughs> we have a, well, we have a couple of Facebook comments that I'll just throw out there, and then um, when you all speak, you can certainly incorporate um, some of your thoughts. Uh, Bob is asking about the nursage so shortage in the country and that relationship to primary care. Um, Mike talks about how we need to deal with chronic conditions and how um, good primary care can can help us do that. Nathan thinks we need to invest more in preventive care, and Amanda supports universal care because she treats too many people who don't have access to primary care, 
and who are bankrupt from their medical bills. So those are a couple of the comments that we've been hearing so far. Just to pick up on the comment regarding access, uh, thank you, Mr. Parle, for inviting us. I'm Bill Leinwerber with the Academy of Physician Assistants, and we're thrilled with the President's focus on primary care, and along with physicians and nurse practitioners, PAs are also among the core providers of primary care in the country. And one of the challenges I think we have an opportunity to address with the, the reform efforts of the administration is um, clearly prevention and incentives uh, and, and the financing and, and bringing all of those things together are key. But at the end of the day, there needs to be a health care provider workforce in place and ready to provide primary <laughs> care. And today there's not. Uh, we have certainly a shortage of primary care physicians. We need more physician assistants. We need more nurse practitioners. And certainly would encourage and would look forward to working with the administration in terms of uh, how do we go about building the pipeline of uh, both physicians and other non-physician practitioners, such as PAs and NPs. Uh, PAs are produced in, you know, a third of the cost and half of the time of physicians. Certainly nurse practitioners are, are uh, more quickly trained as well. Uh, we work very closely in a physician-led team, and we're visible and vocal advocates of a physician-led team, uh, but recognize uh, the, the shortages that are out there and would love to work with the administration so that we can incentivize people to go into primary care, stay in primary care, and likewise, build the pipeline going into primary care by making sure there are faculties, yeah. not only for nursing schools, but for physician assistant schools that would encourage primary care professionals. Great. And we, we are working on this. I mean, we, we, we recognize there are areas of the country where there are shortages, and, and we are going to need more uh, primary care clinicians, including PAs, going forward. Um, we did make, uh, I'm proud that the President did make uh, a, a big investment in this uh, in the beginning of the administration in the Recovery Act, mm -hmm. uh, investing in the National Health Service Corps. Um, that will produce thousands more, uh, but not enough. We know that, that uh, that's just a building block and we'll have to do more going forward and Congress is focused on that as well, so we look forward to working with you on it. Uh, Catherine? Yes, I'm Catherine Nordle. I'm the Executive Director for Professional Practice at the American Psychological Association. Um, I'm not here primarily as a practitioner, but I came to Washington last year in my current position after 30 years of practice uh, in rural and suburban Mississippi. I was a small business owner. I was a Medicare and Medicaid provider and have treated some uh, generations, actually, of families now with both mental and behavioral health issues. And I'd like to bring another perspective to the, the, the chronicity problem and to just some observations about the system. Um, we have the greatest health care in the world here in America, but the problem, I think, is the delivery system. And we have a number of different provider groups represented here today. And I think one thing that's really missing in, in the reform discussion is how we deliver that care. It's like uh, the blind man uh, feeling the elephant, you know. Uh, you're not sure what the animal is because you're only feeling one part of it. So I'd like to make the case for fully integrated care. Uh, we made some tremendous uh, inroads last year with uh, the Mental Health Parity Act, and hopefully that will set the floor so that uh, mental health and substance abuse disorders will be treated like other physical disorders as they should be. Um, if we look even though just in, within the realm of physical medicine, we know that probably 70% of all mental health problems show up first in the primary care doc's office. I worked with family practitioners, pediatricians, nurse practitioners, PAs, uh, and other primary care docs, and they were just absolutely overwhelmed with the complexity of mental health problems that they saw in their practice. And people went there because they wouldn't go to the, like the community mental health center in my community where I started out and then left to do my own practice because the mental health center system is in such shambles that most of the treatment that's provided there now really is tertiary and treatment of chronic care for conditions that had we had good preventive care may not have gotten to that point. Insofar as physical health care is concerned, 75% of our health care dollars are spent on chronic illness. And what is the biggest problem and you mentioned when you were talking about with the pharmacy? It's motivational, motivational issues, 
lifestyle issues and lack of, ad of adherence and compliance. So I would make the argument that if we want to deliver health care in a way that really treats the whole person as a whole person, that we have health care teams mm -hmm. that treat the whole person and that we address the mental health issues as well as the behavioral issues that create and maintain chronic illness at the same time that we're deciding, you know, do we want to give that person a beta blocker or do we want to have a mental health person see them and teach them how to deal with their anxiety? Do we want to have to wait to put somebody on Lipitor when maybe if they'd had appropriate preventive care in regard to nutrition, exercise, and other kinds of lifestyle choices that made them and keep them sick, we can send them all to the pharmacist and then they take half of what's prescribed or they don't take it correctly. But I think we have to deliver care differently and we really have to, to put that emphasis on prevention and incent programs, employers, and payers to pay for that care on the front end so we don't continue with these horrible problems we have with, with chronic physical and mental health conditions. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah, so I'd like to just um, follow on with what Catherine's saying. And um, my, I'm Laurie Kaplan. I'm the executive director of the American College of Nurse Midwives. And you might wonder why midwives are here at the table talking about primary care. That's where um, it starts. <laughs> ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because we, uh, nurse midwives, um, attend childbirth, but we also provide primary care to women across the lifespan. But um, there were two really wonderful reports in the last year. Um, when you look at people who are responsible for delivering care, integrating care to indigent populations. They're really talking about this integrated workforce strategy as being really the most economical way and really showing how that's improving health outcomes when we have nurse practitioners, PAs, certified nurse midwives in these team environments such as academic health centers or national uh, community health centers. We really are lowering the cost of care. We're improving access. And I think you find in some of the disciplines, uh, you have a, a heavy focus on health education, promotion, and wellness. So investing in a workforce that really um, you know, focuses on those skills and really having an integrated workforce uh, strategy. I loved a quote from the Academic Health Centers um, saying, enabling um, all healthcare professionals to function fully within their defined scope of practice would contribute to leveraging workforce capacity and increase access to care. So this is where I think the administration has really shown leadership, I think for the first time in that we're looking at workforce issues, we're looking at payment incentives, we're looking at all of these um, areas, not just access, but um, if not just coverage, but once we have the coverage, how do we make sure that those patients are actually going to have access to care and not just coverage without access? So um, I really encourage us to look in, at workforce and payment reform in a really integrated team approach that's really going to meet the needs of these okay. of consumers. On that. Cheryl and then uh, Bill. Thanks. I'm Sherry Garvin. I'm a licensed pharmacist and pharmacy owner in Leesburg, Virginia. And I appreciate the, the uh, chance to come and talk about health care reform today. It's funny sitting here um, hearing everyone speak, the, the same words keep cropping up and I'm like, yes, yes, I mean, those are the issues. Um, integrated care is huge. We began really seeing the need for that, or at least I did, my eyes were open to it when pharmacists started doing medication therapy management for the Medicare D patients. We get these patients in and they see their cardiologist and they see their orthopedic doctor and their primary care. And before they know it, they're on 24 different medications. Many of them are duplicates or unnecessary. Many of them are causing adverse effects for which they're getting another medication for. Um, so integrated care is huge. Um, the pharmacists have to be a part of that team in order to you know, affect good overall health care. Uh, there's a lot of dollars being wasted because of those, those things happening. The other thing that really struck me was aligned interests. We have to have aligned interests, and that takes care of a whole slew of issues. Um, what do you mean when you say that? Everyone involved in the, in the process of providing health care, the interests have to be aligned. In other words, if the insurance company is only looking at what they're going to spend this year to provide care for that patient, they're going to want to try to make it be the least amount of money possible, when the reality is if you can spend some money on preventative care, that saves a mm -hmm. lot of health care dollars mm -hmm. farther down the road. Um, and and uh, speaking, Diana mentioned uh, preventative care being, being provided. We have a lot of employers, private employers, who have realized this, that their health insurance for their, for their employees, um, and I see that too with my own employees, does not cover certain things. But they have learned that if they put out a few dollars at the beginning for some preventative care, they save a lot. One great example is in the fall we do flu cl clinics 
all around our area. We go to local businesses and provide flu shots for their employees. The business pays for those. But if you think about how much money that saves the business mm -hmm. because they're not out sick for two weeks in the, in the winter or, you know, a host of their employees aren't out all at the same time. So there are, you know, employers beginning to realize that a small amount of money up front for preventative care pays great dividends in the end. Thanks. Uh, Bill and then Tom. Bill Ellis with the American Pharmacist Association Foundation. I, I wanted to build on the comments earlier about integrated um, teams and how important that is. And a lot of times in the discussion about health care reform, sometimes we almost talk about it like we have to create something that's never been mm -hmm. there before. And I think that community health centers in particular are there and serve as great examples. I'll mention specifically the um, El Rio Community Health Center in Tucson, Arizona, providing tremendous care to an underserved population where physicians, pharmacists, and nurses are working very closely. It's a real model. It's not theoretical. It's there. So I'd encourage the administration to, to continue to work with us to identify some of those sites that are there that, that aren't, in theory, their real practices, and I think can help illuminate what a reformed health care system should That's look great. like. It's really then about scaling those models, not yes. necessarily creating something You're right. That's we do new. talk about it as though it's something that something doesn't new. exist. So it's it really exist. more just focusing on what we already have learned can work, mm -hmm. medication therapy management, you know, community health centers. How right. about the primary care medical home? Because yeah. that's been another kind of model that, and I know that, I, I, th I think of the pediatricians because that was when yeah, well, the he, term yeah. first yeah. was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when I was training in school, that was, I remember pediatricians would talk about the medical home and, and how does that realize the success of integrated care, which is a common theme. Uh, so, Mike, thank you very much for I'd say segueing that into perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'll it. get you in a second, Tom. <laughs> My name is Mark Minier, and I'm a practicing pediatrician here in Washington. And there's been a million things that have been talked about that personally affect me and the children that I take care of. First of one is I am a member of the National Health Service Corps, so I am working as a clinician in an underserved community in exchange for getting my loans paid off from medical school um, by the government, which is fantastic. And I will say that is a wonderful program that the administration is putting money into to encourage more people to take those positions. The one thing I do caution is that it's great to get people there, and you mentioned at the beginning, keeping people in primary care yeah. is a huge yeah. um, challenge. It is a very Absolutely. hard job to be a primary care practitioner every day, all day long. I was thinking about it. I got the call yesterday to come from the AAP, thank you very much, and I had to cancel 15 patients this afternoon to be here. But to me, that was really important to get down here to say, you know what, those 15 people, I'll have to fit them in another time because I need to represent the 75 million kids here in the United States and the 9 million kids who don't have insurance because this is something that's really important. But as a primary care doc, I'm making it a priority to be here. And we are a community health center that is doing integrated care, as you mentioned, the AAP created, I believe, the word the medical home, or at least has really kind of um, defined that in a way that talks about co comprehensive, coordinated, culturally appropriate care in a home, a home where everybody serves that patient. So in our center, we have pharmacists, we have OB services, we have social work, we have nutrition, we have all those things that we need to help provide these kids um, the services that they need. I think that the most important thing that we're talking about here if we're talking about early intervention, we're talking about primary prevention, we have to talk about children. If the healthcare reform Absolutely. program does not specifically mention children as a different entity within the program, it, then we've lost everything. I think if we focus on adults, yes, I understand adults have medical concerns. <coughs> I am an adult. And <laughs> <laughs> but if we really want to look at how to prevent problems in the future, then we need to look at children. Um, Medicaid is something that I think is often forgotten about. We talk a lot about Medicare mm -hmm. and how we're going to increase funding for Medicare and how we're going to do all these programs. And then there's Medicaid over here. It's kind of, oh, we'll deal with that later or we'll figure out what we're going to do for children. But I think we really need to spend close attention treating children as children and not just little adults who have very different problems and very different needs. Could I respond to that? As well. You know what, before you do, do you mind if I, because I've called on Tom and I haven't let him talk, so just let him go and then I'll get you. Thank you. Uh, and, and I resonate with virtually everything that's been said around the table uh, thus far. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Tom Menigan with the American Pharmacists Association. I practiced community practice for many years and I still own a pharmacy. Um, 
pharmacists really can play a major role. To go back to the, in, the first individual who, who you had uh, on the, the webcast, um, many of those people who wonder what's wrong with me walk into a pharmacy first. And they look on the OTC shelf to see if there's something that can fix their problem. And pharmacists are too doggone busy in the back to come out and spend the time helping that person because of a system that doesn't put incentives in place to do that. Now, if that individual was part of an integrated group that, that allowed us to work with him to get him to the right doctor, to get him into the system in such a way that we're going to prevent issues, uh, maybe it's something that can be treated easily with an OTC. Maybe it's something that requires uh, 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 care by a nurse practitioner, a physician, or PA. Um, that's what we're all about. We triage all day, every day. It's a big part of what we do. But we're not in a system that incentivizes that. If you shoot ahead of the duck a little bit here and you look at, at healthcare technology, you'll see that, that the big push now is in diagnostics. Uh, and diagnostics are getting closer and closer to the patient all the time. Uh, as that happens, they're going to find their way to pharmacies and they're going to be asking questions in pharmacies. So a system that, that, that prevents people from trying to fix a problem with the wrong things is just as important as one that helps us send them to the right places. And we'd love to work with you to build that kind of system. Those systems don't have to be in, on, in four walls. They can be virtual. Uh, there are a lot of things we can do with wires, and there are people in this room that have done a lot of work in that regard. That's great. Um, you know, I guess j just to point out that sometimes we get the question, can, can what we're professing with regard to MTM scale? Uh, I can tell you that the model that we built with immunization has truly scaled. Today we have over 80,000 pharmacists trained to do immunizations, and this coming flu season we'll do over 5 million immunizations. Uh, we can scale. That's great. Uh, if I can, I'm going to combine my comment now with a couple of things that, that have been said and one of the questions that, that's been asked, but um, I'm with the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners and I'm the Director of Health Policy and one of the things we can tell you is that we have 125,000 nurse practitioners out there that are very interested in, and willing to put their shoulder to all of this. Okay. We are the fastest growing group of, of primary care providers at the present time. So. Um, how long does it take to become a nurse practitioner? Well, it takes, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the long haul, it takes six years to become a nurse practitioner because you have to become a, a professional nurse first and then you go back to get your graduate work to, in order to become an advanced practice uh, nurse and to be a nurse practitioner. So we're talking about a significant period of time, it's true. Um, the, um, the, the thing that nurse practitioners have done through the years is incorporated prevention in everything they do. Um, they are very hot on uh, uh, disease prevention and health promotion. So this has been something that has been incorporated in the medical home model that we've been talking about, the coordinated uh, primary care um, model that is holistic, et cetera, is, has been our mantra for forever. That's, that's the way we do things, and we feel that that's very much couched in our nursing background uh, to which we add the, the, um, the medical expertise. And that's one of the things when you're looking at this, we certainly need more nurse practitioners and we certainly would like to have um, some uh, help in, in producing more of them um, as well. Um, but um, we also know that uh, some of the models that are out there that would be really uh, useful that we need to have people look at relate to the question that was related to chronic care. Uh, the nursing models that are out there that have been so significant aren't being picked up uh, and looked at in terms of um, what can be be done in relation to, to, uh, to dealing with chronic care, and yet they're the most successful models. And so I think looking at some of the nurse practitioner lit literature and the, and the nursing literature and looking at the studies that have been done and trying to see how we can plug that into the system I think would be a very, very good thing. And we're willing to try Please whenever help you're us. ready. <laughs> we'll like we, have a care. we have a question from the internet again. Yeah, we actually have a couple of comments. Um, there are a lot of different discussions going on online um, in response to what you're saying. One talks about um, you know, people who don't have insurance or people who know uh, folks who don't have insurance and just how primary care can't be a priority then, but there's a woman who has cancer and two young kids and just talks about you know, now she needs to try to treat her cancer without insurance, but the importance of if she had had primary care from the beginning. Uh, there was a discussion about incentives and how um, you know, people at work or uh, trying to just incentivize people to focus on prevention and wellness and um, really prioritize primary care 
And then there was a conversation about um, ER use and primary care and how because a lot of people don't have insurance or uh, delay care, they often wind up going to the ER where the care is much more expensive, the condition is much worse, and that um, contributes to longer waits at the ER. So thank you to Bob and Erica and Amanda, Lynn and Tim for those comments. And it contributes to higher costs for mm -hmm. everybody who's insured. Mm -hmm. So it's just a vicious cycle, cycle going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, Maggie? Hi, Maggie Mitchell here on behalf of the American Dental Hygienist Association. I just want to jump in quickly and say, as long as we've had all the talk about prevention, that as you all know, because we all have a mouth. <laughs> all the children are all now adults, but we all have a mouth. And um, dental hygienists are the preventive professional in the oral health care team. And there is no workforce shortage right now of dental hygienists. There are 150,000 currently licensed in the United States. And so. Why is there no workforce shortage with dental well, they've hygienists? Just, they, there was. There was. There was, ago, yeah. And they've, they've and they dressed been, it. That has been one of ADHA's yeah. priorities is to encourage. Um, it's mostly women. I was going to say women. It's women and yeah. men, but it's a lot but of I, women. But I mean, when you look at the other shortages, you have to be honest and say, in some cases, it's reimbursement or it's working conditions. I mean, when I threw out that question at the beginning, I was serious about how can we prevent, like Dr. Ralston, you know, the, the people that you practice with, I bet there's people in your community who are saying, I'm done with this, I'm tired of it. Well, how do as a we... matter of fact, it's actually happening yeah. as we speak. So how do we keep them doing it? Anyway, I interrupted so, you. No, but I was just going to say, we strongly urge that um, oral health care be included in in this whole overall health care reform debate. You know, you can't gum an apple. <laughs> uh, Bob, and then... Yeah, just a few comments. I, I work for American College of Physicians, but I'm not a clinician. I'm a policy guy. And so my world is focusing on what's going on with Congress right now. And I think here in the discussion today, it strikes me how important that we have a comprehensive approach. If we deal with workforce by itself, but don't deal with coverage, we're going to fail. We deal with coverage without dealing with workforce, we're going to fail. So we have to start with the premise everybody has to have affordable coverage. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have affordable coverage that covers primary care and preventive services. We need a workforce of physicians, nurses, PAs, and others to provide care to these people that hopefully will have insurance coverage. And I think a very big part that we really haven't talked about too much is payment reform. Right now in our system, we overvalue procedures. We pay physicians, nurses, and others on an a la carte, fee-for-service basis we pay for fragmented care and uncoordinated care. You know, we all talk about teams. Why don't we have high-functioning teams? Because that's not what we pay for in the United States. And part of, I think, the answer to keep people in practice is to start by reforming the current payment systems. And yesterday, Medicare had a big announcement that a proposed rule to raise payments to primary care clinicians very substantially, which is a very first step. But then we need to move to other payment models that are aligned with value, because we believe that primary care will be shown to be the best value in the healthcare system. Great. Uh, Daniel? Uh, my name's uh, Dan Thibodeau. I'm a practicing physician assistant in uh, Virginia, and I'm also an educator as well. So uh, I speak very strongly about workforce issues. Uh, <clears throat> two comments I wanted to make. But first, uh, I, I certainly appreciate all that all of you do for the health of all of our, uh, our patients that we take care of. Uh, but one, uh, we're very uh, supportive of the idea of the medical home and uh, I want to emphasize that PAs are part of the uh, medical home concept. Uh, the notion that we uh, offer an insurance plan for someone with a very high deductible is very counterintuitive to prevention and wellness, uh, and then we wait for something to happen for the disease so we can treat it. Mm -hmm. And so certainly we're going to have to shift the philosophy of how we look at the patient as a whole and the idea of prevention. Uh, when it comes to workforce issues, uh, I, I cannot emphasize enough the need for more clinical sites. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, Congressman Glenn Nye, who is, in our, uh, is representing our district, uh, and uh, it's, it's not just about providing more seats in a classroom, it's the, di it's the clinical side when we have to go out and get preceptors to actually want to teach students in the clinical setting, and I think that's going to be the real issue, not just for physician assistants, but for physicians, nurse practitioners. How do we a, do that? Well, he asked me the same thing. And the, the honest answer is, I, quite honestly, I think we're going to have to incentivize physicians to want to, to teach. My wife is an obstetrician. She has medical assistants, LPNs, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and physicians all wanting to get into her practice on top of taking care of her patients. So 
there has to be an emphasis of prioritizing your patients first, but then having the altruism there, but that's clearly an overload on, on the system. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to have to find more individuals that are going to be willing to take on mm -hmm. the education of more providers if we're talking about increasing the workforce. Oh, yeah. You That's probably all see, those of you in education, this was certainly, when I was a first year med student, there was a, gl a, a ton of us that wanted to do primary care. We couldn't find preceptor sites. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only reason we didn't all go into primary care. I did, but I was, by the time I got to my fourth year, I was one of a handful out of 200 who did. Mm -hmm. And that's repeated itself, I, I would imagine, in every Absolutely. area, that yep. we just couldn't find a role model. Mm -hmm. And the role models we did have were not happy. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and why would you want to go into something like right, that? Right. Yeah. that was, Exactly. That was everybody, my friends who were nurses, right. dentists, mm -hmm. all of it. Well, we have programs that are having to turn students away because they, don't, they can't find enough clinical sites. Right. We've had programs that have closed mm -hmm. because they can't find yeah. enough clinical sites. And so we, yeah. another part of the problem issue. is also that um, not enough of the providers are reimbursed in any way. We have a, a system in which, um, for example, physician residents can come in and, you know, the, the hospital is reimbursed for training those physicians, but um, we are, as an institution, my hospital is not uh, reimbursed for training nurse practitioners or nurse midwives. And so as a certified nurse midwife in the inner city, I work with a largely uninsured population, all on Medicaid. These women come in with no dental care. They need behavioral health resources. They need preventive care of all types, and they are not able to access that care until they're pregnant. So once they're pregnant, I, we have a window of opportunity then, uh, you know, a nine-month period in which we are their medical home. They come to me for everything. They, we develop a relationship with them, and we refer them for those much-needed services. But then again, I, while I'd love to train more um, nurse midwives to you know, fill this void, we can't do it because there's no, there's no funds for it. Ford and it really drains our resources. So it's, it's really a big problem. Yeah. Carolyn. I'm director of nurse midwifery and women's health nurse practitioner program at Georgetown University. And I've, I've actually spent the greatest part of my career as a practitioner. And we always had students, um, and the lineup was as you speak. I mean, the demand was far more than we could possibly take at a time when reimbursement was dwindling for the uh, practice and you know we're getting fewer and fewer cents back on the dollar while we're trying to train more and more students. Now I've uh, I jumped the fence and now I'm in <laughs> education and I'm begging, I mean literally begging my friends in practice to please take my students because mm -hmm. I my, the limitation on the number of students that we can take is literally based on uh, clinical sites. And, and we're sitting in the middle of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. where there are health care providers, as you all know, that we're falling over. Yes. But trying to get those sites is incredibly difficult. And in There's my, no incentive. Exactly. And in my situation, we, uh, at the nurse midwives, we already train family practice residents um, for, you know, in obstetric care. Yes, yeah, she turned me down. And I have to turn her <laughs> But it's because my hospital administration will not allow me to take a nurse midwife student because they feel that, you know, they're they not getting anything out of the deal. Where, you know, we're, we're already training the family practice docs. So it's really a, a big issue. Wow. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, Keith and then Michelle. Thank you. Um, we do have the greatest health care system in the world, but unfortunately we're paying the price for it. Um, and go to answer the young lady back to the, the, the lady that has cancer and can't afford her treatment. Um, she can't afford the much needed medications because in this country we're paying more than any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. The largest purchaser in this country, the federal government, is paying more for medications than anyone else. Mm -hmm. The largest group paying more for those medications than anyone in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And to go back to Medicaid, Mark mentioned Medicaid is often forgotten. The high price of those medications when pharmacies are reimbursed on average manufacturer's price um, below what we actually pay for that medication what are we going to do? We're going to drop those contracts. I ran a spreadsheet when average manufacturer's price first came out, ran the numbers, and I actually lost money on every prescription for Medicaid, every generic prescription that I filled. So there's no incentive to use a much cost-effective alternative with a generic medication. So what are we going to do? We're going to change that patient to a brand-name medication and end up paying more. 
Now the folks, if, if I took that Medicaid contract, and I don't mind giving you the numbers, my net profit below what I actually paid for that medication was minus $20,000 at 2%, 2.4% Medicaid. I'm very low Medicaid in my area. The average in Virginia is about 16%. Mm. Now when you get out to the valley, in the rural areas, you're looking at 50, 60% or even higher. And that is access. People are going to, the pharmacies are going to drop those contracts and folks and our patients are not going to have access to their much needed medications. Mm. So we're paying the highest price in the world. We have questions at this end of the table. Okay, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Michelle, and then I'll come on this end, okay? Um, thanks, I'm Michelle Herbert Thomas and I'm a pharmacist uh, in, down in Richmond and my family owns uh, three pharmacies and my job within our company is, um, well, I love what I do and I work with patients every day. Um, it's a little bit less traditional uh, when it comes to pharmacy practice, but I wanted to comment on access to care um, with my two main responsibility areas um, are medication therapy management um, and there are definitely access issues. There, there's not um, there's not a problem accessing a prescription drug, you know, if you have your coverage, but beyond that, medication therapy management access is, is very low. We have thousands of patients, and many of those patients have Medica Medicare who should get medication therapy management coverage. Um, but of all of those, each, uh, twice each year, I get the opportunity to provide medication therapy management to a handful of patients through the Medicare services. And that's because the insurers are offering um, service medication therapy management services that aren't directly offered by the individual pharmacist who takes care of the patient. The patient doesn't know the person and whether or not they're contacting and doing anything with those patients, I do not know, but I know that the problems that exist with those patients, it appears to me that it's not being done. Um, letters don't work. Letters, letters don't and, work. and calls from an um, a outside person who does, is not aware of what's going on with that patient is not really the most effective way to help improve um, their care using medication therapy management. So the access is very, very low to a service that I think we, we all agree is is a needed service. Um, it's just not getting to the patients that need it. So that was the first thing I wanted to comment on um, and, and really very much appreciate that um, Medicare coverage is there for that service, but we just really need to expand it. Um, so the second area of responsibility I have is I've, um, I run a diabetes education program that is an integrated program. I have a nurse um, and a dietitian and myself, a pharmacist. Um, we uh, receive referrals from physicians to provide diabetes education services. In most cases in our um, program, it's people with newly diagnosed diabetes. So they're very much out of control. Um, they're very scared. They don't know what to do. They need help with, you know, from my role is to help with, you know, what medications uh, are doing to help them and what they need to do to work with lifestyle issues and how medication works in with that. Um, but again, uh, as a program that is uh, non-traditional, that's not in a hospital system, in the Richmond area there are three um, ADA recognized diabetes education programs that are available for patients to select from. Two of those three are based in hospitals. Um, so there's, uh, there, are several there are several insurers who refuse to compensate us for our services because we are not hospital based. So um, why would that have matter? to turn down patient, all patients who are State of Virginia employees and all patients who have Aetna, then physicians say, well, I can't refer patients to them. I don't remember who I can't refer there. So, you know, that means we have less opportunity to help patients. And really with three diabetes education programs in all of the Richmond area, that's not enough as it is. And for us to not be able to have access to those patients, I think there's a lot more people we could help. Why would the fact that it's hospital-based make a difference? From I wish I Clinically, why would that, that matter? I think that, um, you know, 
it, having called multiple times and asked and gotten the same answer, um, it sounds to me like, you know, they get national contracts, so if it's a hospital system, you know, they can, they can contract with, you know, Diabetes Treatment Centers of America across the country, um, and they, they can't let anyone else in. Um, so, but that really does limit access to diabetes education um, programs. Bruce. Hey. Um, Nancy, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to, to be with you today, and it's, I think it's really, I commend you for bringing together practitioners. The other forms I've participated in, we've had health systems and physicians and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, all sorts of folks, and, and bringing this focused uh, under primary care, I think, makes an awful lot of sense. I think primary care really is going to hold a lot of the answers to health care reform. Um, from, I'm Bruce Roberts from the National Community Pharmacist Association. I'm a community pharmacist. and. I think that I, I, a lot of what's been said, whether it be aligned interest, uh, uh, um, a fully integrated system, we all, I think, would agree that that is where we need to, to, get, to go. With pharmacy, uh, specifically related to those areas, I think that there's some, I would just highlight some, uh, some real problems out there in, in healthcare. Uh, with pharmacy, you know, said for every dollar spent on prescription drugs, there's a dollar's worth of problems. There's studies that back that up. And so the, so the reality of how do we pay for health care reform, if we can just get the pharmacist integrated into the healthcare system and begin to, to really make sure prescription drugs are used correctly, we can save an awful lot of uh, health care dollars. I mean, there's great examples of, uh, of where, you know, pharmacists and physicians and, and the rest of the health care team have worked together to make sure that patients adhere to their medications uh, with models that align the incentives between, you know, uh, all, all the different players and, and health care costs go down. I mean, it's, it's amazing the money that can be spent. And so one of the things that I would really uh, recommend uh, that you give serious consideration to and some of the bills that are, the language that's coming out are beginning to talk about it, and the President has talked about it an awful lot, and that is the whole interoperability of health care, the technology that's going to be required because we can talk about all these wonderful things about an integrated system, but if we don't have the systems in place, we don't have the technology to embrace that, uh, you know, whether it's from an electronic medical record, from a prescriber to, you know, the pharmacist, and we're all integrated in a way that, that drives maximum value to those patients, we'll never get there. So um, I think that's really, really important. And from pharmacy's perspective, too, we have, uh, in many instances, been siloed. Uh, in healthcare, uh, uh, Medicare Part D is an absolute tremendous example of not of how not to do it uh, because you have the prescription drug benefit in a siloed. All it's about is driving down the cost of the drug, and it, and there's no incentive. I mean, actually, there is an in, there's a disincentive uh, for prescription drugs to be used correctly because the reality is, if you don't take them, the insurer or whomever the Medicare Part D provider is does better. Um, and so we, we really need to make sure that we, you know, we're aligning those interests, we're making sure that we have a fully integrated system, and pharmacy can, I think, pharmacy can play a real significant role in helping control those costs uh, as long as they're considered. And we appreciate in the medical home that, you know, it says non-physician providers can, are going to be part of that, but I think we need to get more specific to say, you know, what practitioners are going to be involved in the medical home. We've got, we've got another set of comments, I think, from, from the Internet. And then, and then Mary had her hand up right before Jen had her comments. Um, so there was a discussion about what cost issues in primary care, which we had just been talking about. Mm -hmm. And Michael from St. Paul, Minnesota, talked about how support for training is really important. So it touched on what we were talking about here. Um, Brian from Washington, D.C., talked about shortages in all professions. Um, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and Julie from Reno, Nevada said that the number of students at her college uh, taking classes in nursing is tied to the number of faculty they have for nursing. And so um, she talked about the need for more faculty. And then there was a long discussion on costs in primary care. Um, Angela and Justin and Diane talked about the high cost of COBRA. There was a comment from Florida about the high costs for small businesses for all types of care. Um, but highlighting primary. And then there was a discussion as well about um, liability premiums and making it financially reasonable for people to stay in primary care um, by trying to lower uh, premiums. And Julie and Mary also talked about premiums as well. 
Who's next? Could be Mary, 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 Mary and then Jean. Um, I'm Mary Alvord. I'm a full-time psychologist practitioner as well as a business owner. Small. We have two offices in suburban Maryland, um, so I manage the practice as well. So a lot of these issues that are being brought up resonate both from various hats. But I wanted to talk about a couple of things. I guess the stigma of mental health and making sure that psychologists are truly viewed as health providers and that parity really becomes implemented in a way that psychologists are on the table because so many people file complaints about physicians or others but they don't want to go and file any complaints to insurance regarding their mental health issues and I think it's because of the, so much of the stigma. But in addition, I work um, primarily with children and adolescents so I want to make sure like Mark that they really are not just little adults. It takes specialized training. Um, psychologists are doctorally trained to be on sort of the adult to work with children and adolescents. And so many parents are reluctant um, to have to even use insurance when they do. So that's another issue that needs to be addressed. I think that's partly the stigma. We need prevention for children. We create all of these, we just as we all have mouths, we were all children and create um, habitual patterns. You know, the obesity epidemic now is created to, is, is related very much in part to lifestyle choices and we're trying to educate, but there isn't the incentive for people to do a, a lot of work in that. So I'd like for parents to be able to get some preventive um, services and not wait until the children's problems are so great. We work collaboratively with schools, with pediatricians, and many psychologists, um, I know many providers, are re less reluctant, um, more reluctant to work with children because of all of the time, the extra time that is spent collaborating that's not reimbursed at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jean. Thank you. I'm Jean Carter. I'm also a psychologist, and I have a practice here in Washington, D.C. I want actually to pick up on one of the things that Mary just said, or she stole it out of my mouth, around stigma. Um, that, that's a very significant issue around, um, around mental health, and people think of mental health as over here and separate it off from the notions of behavioral health. And so all of what we've been talking about, about prevention, is really about changing behavior. We often think about it as, you know, we get these tests with these numbers and that's part of prevention, and it is part of it. But then what do you do with those? And how do we help people change their behavior so that their, the prevention actually becomes a lifestyle change, actually becomes the kinds of activities that people need to engage in for better health and for health promotion? So incidentally, um, sort of on the side of that, I would love to see us talk about healthcare homes rather than medical homes so that we expand the notion to a, a broader perspective um, that includes things like behavior change. One of the issues that we face in expanding this notion of mental health to behavioral health is that the mental health coverage which is what pays psychologists, is often in a carve-out, which means that it's limited, it's separate, it, it can't really be integrated in the same way into health care more broadly, as long as it's, it's kept carved out. And in addition to that, the limits that we end up facing is that the CPT codes, the procedure codes, and the diagnostic codes that psychologists can use and other mental health providers it are limited to only certain kinds of services. So we're limited to things like psychotherapy, which doesn't translate well to helping with issues of compliance around meds. So expanding the notion of how psychologists can be paid, how mental health can be paid for, and how we can move it to notions of behavioral health I think would be a tremendous thing for us to be able to do. I think Randolph was next. Thank you, Thank you Ms. DeParle. We appreciate the invitation um, and applaud what the President is doing on health care. It's a tremendously difficult topic. I'm Randy Brooks. I'm an optometrist practicing in New Jersey. 
and I'm the president of the American Optometric Association. Like Mark, I'm a practitioner and uh, changed all my office hours for today for patients because it's an important thing to do. Thank you. We apologize to your patients. But not, not at all. Um, optometrists render about 70% of the primary eye care in this country. Uh, in, we are in 7,000 communities, and in 3,000 of those communities, we are the only eye care practitioner. And we render care from a from perspective that's both preventative as well as, as, well as medical care. Uh, our, our practitioners are in rural settings and urban settings, and we do see shortages. Um, we encourage increased involvement in community health centers. Prevention and early intervention is a tremendous key. Uh, we've heard it here today. Bill and I served on an NCQA committee, and we found that um, you could achieve a lot more bang for the buck in terms of early intervention and care, because not only is there less spent on disease management when intervention occurs early, whether it's a, a diabetic patient or a glaucoma patient, but it, it also is a contribution to less lost time at work. Uh, every day in our office, we counsel patients, whether it's on their A1C, smoking cessation, control of their hypertension, or a nutritional therapy on macular degeneration. We see cost of medicines as a huge issue in this country. Many patients come in and can afford their copay, but they can't afford their medicine. And when I prescribe a medication, I have to look toward the affordability uh, and whether the patient will be adherent and compliant with the therapy. Our primary focus and our primary concern is on everything that's being generated being patient-centered. The patient is the important person here, not the practitioner. And the patient needs the choice. The patient needs access. The patient needs access for whatever the covered service is, whether it's routine eye care, which may be covered under a, a routine vision plan, or medical care that we render and be seeing my glaucoma patients or removing a metallic foreign body from someone's eye. To me, it's critical that the patients have their choice of practitioner. If a practitioner is able to and licensed to provide that particular service, provides quality care, there shouldn't be any artificial restrictions or barriers on who provides that care. So we feel that's an important piece to the healthcare picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Has everybody had a chance to speak once at least? Okay, so the, because we're repeating some people now. Okay, Mona? I'll, I'll defer to Jan, but she's going to have, she really wants to talk. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to bring up the health IT thing. Um, there was a mention of small business um, issues, which kind of kind of triggered my thinking a little bit because that's one of the big frustrations I think everybody in this room has is that you know money was put in the stimulus package for health IT, and I don't imagine anybody that's sitting in this room well maybe a few, <laughs> um, but most of us had you know weren't able to see any of that money, uh, and yet these are the practices, our practices are the small practices that really need shoring up and those of us who are dealing with vulnerable populations, we need help with, with being able to establish medical records as well, but it's very hard to kind of get that over the top and it's something that parity in a lot of these things would be really helpful. Thanks. Come on, go ahead. Thank you. Um, one of the things, I go back to my pediatrician colleague over there, is the CHIP program and the Medicaid program and that kind of thing, you have a lot of practices that are not 330 grantees, like the FQHC lookalikes, like all of the nurse managed centers, like the, the small, but they're serving the vulnerable population and they have no access to any of the stimulus monies. Mm -hmm. Mark, I guess. I was going to pick up on what uh, Mona said as well, and also kind of going way back to what Keith said about Medicaid contracts. And I'm very fortunate. I work for a FQHC who I'm salaried, so I don't have to worry about my reimbursement for Medicaid. I have 100% Medicaid population or uninsured or Medicaid eligible, but I don't worry about what my reimbursement rate is because we are contained within an FQHC. But that practitioner who works in a rural community or in a small community that needs to decide, will I take a Medicaid child mm -hmm. where I'm not going to be reimbursed for what I actually do? I think the business person in you at some point has to say, I can't do it. Even if your heart says, I want to, they may for a while do as much as they can to see that kid and do what they can for them. But at some point, the bottom line, I think, ends up becoming um, so important that they have to deny care to those kids. So I think that, again, going back to Medicaid and making sure that while well, FQHCs are protected, I, I'm happy about that, that the individual practitioners and smaller practices are, well, is, are also looked at as far as their Medicaid reimbursement rates. The electric company won't accept zucchini. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they won't. <laughs> just doesn't work. Michelle. Okay, thank you. Um, I just really wanted to add on to uh, the pediatric, the issue with pediatrics as it relates to diabetes. And I think one of the most 
difficult uh, family issues to deal with is a, a child who develops a chronic illness. And mm -hmm. when it's diabetes, the child ends up in the hospital. And uh, everything changes for that child. Everything changes for that family. Uh, Medicaid, um, at least in the state of Virginia, does not cover uh, diabetes education services at all. Uh, so a child of a family who is uh, without the, the privileged life um, does not get any training on how to live past that diagnosis. And they're in and out of the hospital, and they don't know what to do, and it's a very scary way to live. And it, it takes a long time for them to figure out how <coughs> to manage that disease without that, you know, without, without that background of education on on management, so I think that's another way that system is kind of failing mm -hmm. the children. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about a number of ways to, to save healthcare dollars um, long term. Um, we talked about outcomes, paying uh, providers incentives to, to increase outcomes. We talked about medication therapy management, but what else can we do to, to lower healthcare costs? Um, if the federal government is going to be a stakeholder in this, they need to know what they're paying for. We need to have a transparent system, no hidden fees, no hidden costs, no hidden rebates. They need to know what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be a transparent system. I'm not saying that companies can't make a profit. If they're aligned with the, the private insurers or whoever, companies need to make a profit. You know, they have stockholders. You know, I'm, I'm a, in, a, a business person as well, and I need to make a profit and, and meet payroll and, and pay myself, hopefully. Um, but we need to have a transparent system to know what we're paying for. And that's one huge way to lower health care dollars in the long run. It makes it more affordable in health care premiums. It lowers drug costs. It lowers cro costs across the board. Tina? Uh, we also have to pay for the right care at the right time. Going to the question about the ER problem, you know, the use of, especially, you know, in my population in inner city Baltimore where, um, you know, nobody has insurance and the, and the average community patient um, in my practice uh, for midwifery is um, maybe 19 years old, um, possibly Hispanic, African American, high rates of m major um, socioeconomic problems and behavioral problems, substance abuse, um, HIV rates are very high in the city. And these people don't have primary care, and the only care they get, like I said before, is when they're pregnant. And so they, they come in, and, and because we're able to have a practice in which we, are, we can reach out to them, we've encouraged them to call us at any time. We always have a, a midwife and, and a doctor on staff at the hospital, and they are encouraged to call so that we can eliminate some of the walk-in problems that are seen, especially um, in OB um, and, and amongst the uninsured and, and the un uncovered. But also, this is a problem in, in everybody's ER. Mm -hmm. People don't have a place where they can go and a place, a relationship with a provider at all of any kind. And so you end up uh, spending so much money just trying to cover the problems that you could have possibly um, paid for had, had you established a person for that, that patient to contact. So I think that's one of the ways in which we can really improve care is to just get in there, get people the care that they need at the right time so that they're not going back. You know, if we can get to a, a woman in early part of pregnancy and talk to her about her lifestyle, her behavior, prevent the diabetes from happening, prevent the preeclampsia from happening, which costs us so much money. You know, childbirth is the number one reason for admission to the hospital in this country. And we throw so much money at it, but we don't have the best outcomes in the world. And there are practices, in, in my practice, for example, we have a 14% C-section rate in a very, very high-risk population because of the way that we, um, the integrative practice that we have and the fact that it's, m these people are managed um, in, a, in a women's medical home type model by nurse midwives in collaboration with the physicians and the rest of the healthcare <coughs> care team. And we're saving the system an incredible amount of money, but it's just one little practice. If you can expand these types of um, practice settings that have proven to make a difference that people don't really know about that are out there, I think we can really save the system a lot of money and also prevent all of this ER admission, you know, that, that happens that really bogs down our system. Yeah. Well, Fred? 
Moving back a little to 30,000 feet to sort of incorporate a lot of what, what different people were saying today, um, I think most of us here would agree that the patient-centered medical home, although the name nobody likes, I mean, a lot of people think they're being sent to the home, yeah. uh, but for, for lack of a better term, that's where we really want to be in the future. And evidence will guide us toward the best way to deliver that care, the best mix of professionals uh, to do it. But in the meantime, there are a number of the chess pieces that we do know we need to get in, in alignment. We need, we desperately need workforce uh, uh, um, stability among those already there. And, and I, I just look back in my 25 years in practice. When I first went into practice, I did the little um, exhibit where I helped them start the RBRVS system. I had my little clipboard with the timer. My life was totally different then than it is now. Most of what I was done, uh, did for a patient was in the exam room and, and dictating immediately following the visit. Now that's perhaps half of, of my time. I had time to teach med students, residents, most practitioner students. I don't have time, even before my public policy hobby, to, to, to do that. And I think what we have to do is we have to have some transitional issues. Granted, the current payment system is imperfect, but we need to stabilize those who are currently in practice and have happy practitioners who can be role models, who can teach, and who provide an opportunity to bridge that toward where we all know that we need to be eventually. Amen. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yes, Diana? Um, I, I would like to back up a little bit to some things I've heard around the table today, and that is certainly um, that we need all hands on deck. We need all people to be able to do what they are capable of doing without artificial barriers. And I think that that's the 800 pound elephant in a lot of rooms is allowing people to, to do what they know how to do, what they have been educated to do. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, evidence is out there. Mm -hmm. There is evidence. And, you know, we have, to, we have to address those artificial barriers. Some people are unhappy in primary care because they're limited to, to certain things that, that they wouldn't be mm -hmm. if we didn't have these artificial barriers. I also wanted to comment on the Medicare, um, or I mean the Medicaid issue. In my state of Indiana, because nurse practitioners can't be primary medical providers, we have, um, we have off, uh, practices where you have these available, excellent providers, but they can't see the patients because the physician panel is full. So they drive past your clinic 30 miles down the road in their rickety old car at $4 a gallon of gas or $3, whatever it is now, when there are two perfectly willing, educated, ready to work primary care providers mm -hmm. who are underutilized. Mm -hmm. And that happens all the time. I work in a rural area that's between a bunch of, of different towns. and. My practice is the safety net for a large town where no one takes Medicaid anymore. They just, they just don't want to deal with it. Um, and so what's so, the solution to that? What's the solution to that? Use all the people you have. Yeah, remove right. the barriers. Use the people remove you have. Barriers. Barriers. Get rid of the barriers. 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 You know, how do you do that? <laughs> you X these things off the books because they're old time, old fashioned, old thinking fossilized ways of <laughs> thinking. You're talking about the state scope of practice laws? Well, there are just, state and federal. They're, well, they're they're several, federal barriers. Federal there, are, there are federal barriers. I can't order home care. I've taken care of Mrs. B for 15 years, and she now needs home care before she goes to the nursing home or wherever else she goes. I can't do that. I've taken care of her. I've managed all of her chronic medical problems, but when she has to be at home and she's on Medicare, I can't order that. I or have to find PAs, someone, PAs. I have to find someone who doesn't know this patient at all, right. who trusts me because they know me, that will say, oh yeah, sure, okay, okay. And, and you know, and they- charge you to sign it. Well, or charge you, you know, you do pay collaboration fees, I do. Um, and the same with, with hospice, you know, you've taken care of this person, 
Um, they've developed cancer, you know, they've been through all of their treatments, they're at the end of their life. We want them to have a comfortable way of, of leaving this world. And I can't order hospice. I can be an attending in hospice, but I can't order it. We'll have to go find somebody who doesn't know this patient at all, who has to then step in and, and order this hospice that I can then carry on with. I mean, those are things that are just so stupid and frustrating for us in the field. I just, you know, it just is a very, very difficult thing. And I've done this for 18 years. And I was a nurse for many years before that. And, and that would be one of the things that would make me just want to throw in the towel and walk away. Mm -hmm. See, and it's the same thing at pharmacy. I mean, pharmacy, pharmacists are not recognized as practitioners. They have no recognition under Medicare Part B. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, if, you know, to the extent that you can get all these practitioners working together to make sure that you know, the patient is taken care of mm -hmm. um, and put, get rid of these artificial barriers so that the, the entire team can work together, ultimately we can drive much better outcomes oh at gosh. much less cost. Um, than the system we have today. I have so to ask Dr. Ralston. Do you oh, agree? Well, you, you, I, I, I would love here. for us to evolve toward a constantly changing practice environment. And, and, and I understand that the administration has taken some great strides toward improving the rather flawed PQRI program. But, but to me, I would love to have the data that shows exactly what the right mix of providers is in our practice, adding certain types of either physicians, PAs, or nurse practitioners, whether that improves quality, lower, lowers costs, and, and that will evolve over time. But I think importantly for all of us, we need to be the first one to get the feedback on the quality of care that we provide. It can be spun off to as many other entities as want it, but it shouldn't be claims kind of data being thrown at us and just interfering with our work cycle. We need to have sort of a dimming kind of continuous quality improvement approach. And I think a lot of these issues, I mean, Mona and I were talking earlier, one-on-one, -on -one, we could handle an awful lot of the things that, that, you know, that we talk about in, in theory being difficult. I mean, when we first met, the ACP and the nurse practitioners have been talking with each other. We gave examples of particular kind of patients. <laughs> And once we talked about real world examples, we found out we had a lot more in, in common and we understood that we faced common challenges. In theory, uh, you know, in the past, we maybe talked past each other. But we need to have more communication and we desperately need help from an administration because we have more in common in our daily frustrations than we do in opposition. So we're getting close to our time and, and we have some comments from the internet. and. Nancy Ann could spend all day here, but part of Jen and I, our job is to make sure she can, can get to her next, her next thing that she has to solve the healthcare crisis on. So I do want to mention, though, that um, we will be, there's, there's an opportunity to kind of continue to contribute your ideas on healthreform.gov. So I want to say that to not cut off anyone in the audience or on the internet that didn't get a chance but would like to keep this dialogue going. So Jen, did you have more? Yep, um, I guess I'll just do some larger summary comments. There have been a bunch of discussions going on. Um, but Jeanette mentioned, you know, we need to remember that preventive care will keep costs down and reduce the number of visits to hospitals and give people more time who really need attention. And uh, Chris focused on how so many people are dying of diseases that are prevent preventable. And so, you know, focusing on primary care from the get go is really important. And then um, Deb talked about how we need to teach preventive care and, and really focus on healthy education, um, ch childhood nutrition, and also lowering childhood obesity. Um, but everyone very much agreed with what you were saying, so um, you know, they appreciate the discussion. So there were a couple of themes. I know Nancy Ann gets, gets the last word, but it, it's, we've done a number of these in the White House and, and just listening kind of outside from the town halls that were done across the country, but then a lot of the dialogues that have been going on that some of you have hosted in your homes. And a lot of it centers back to kind of a mutual respect. And especially in the world of primary care, I think that's something that's constantly reverberating. And it's not just mutual respect of, of what our titles or our identities are, but it's the mutual respect with transparency and with the industry complex, whether it's pharmaceuticals, insurance, doctors, hospitals. No, we didn't really talk about hospitals here, but I, when I was in practice, that was a constant tension for our community practice was our main hospitals. And kind of we always felt like we were in opposition 
to each other instead of working hand in hand. So the mutual respect aspect, I've, I've been taking a lot of notes, which I'll get to, to Nancy Ann and the rest of the team, but really realigning incentives and making sure that what we're paying for is really high quality and the right care at the right time, and also understanding that we don't necessarily have the answers to what the right care or the right mix is, but that we've got to be open to evolving as a system so that we can make room for that. And then the health IT issues, I think there are a number of us that um, have been very supportive of the president's, thankfully to all of you, who have, who's really championed getting health IT and really taking this to the forefront of the public conversation, but that's certainly not the end. And so keeping working on that and making sure it's truly accessible. And then workforce issues all around. I don't think anyone, maybe the dental hygienists are in good shape. That's <laughs> <laughs> a bit of good news. <laughs> that's like, so we can take that back and say, check, we finished that one. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else is still, still. They haven't gotten But out maybe you should teach us what it is you're doing. Yeah. That's what I was <laughs> that's wondering. working. <laughs> So I don't know with that, Nancy. I yeah, I, I have found this very inspiring, and in it and in thinking about it, we have done a number of these discussions. Yep. And one thing that that really struck me about this one is uh, how uh, constantly the patient was at the center of this whole conversation with each of you and the comments that you've made. And I find that really inspiring. And uh, you've expressed some frustration with the way things work right now, and your inability to really. Uh, treat the whole patient and make sure that they're getting the preventive care and primary care that they need. But also, thank you uh, for, for highlighting some of the models that are working out there and the community health centers and some of the things that you're doing around the country that are working and that we can build upon uh, as we look toward uh, hopefully a healthier future for America's families. And so I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing and for continuing to help us uh, to try to craft a better, a better uh, system going forward. So thank you very much for taking thank the time. You. Thank Apologize you. to your patients again That's right. <laughs> for, for your missing the afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much. You too. Yeah. Go get them. Oh. <laughs> She's a go getter. I think we got good to meet you. Uh huh.